Hello, and welcome to Learning the Social Sciences. Today, we are going to be examining the life of French King Louis XIV. King Louis XIV came to the throne as a four-year-old child and will go on to have the longest reign of any European monarch. Throughout his time on the French throne, he was able to reduce the power of the nobility, construct the lavish palace of Versailles, but also lead France into a series of wars that will hurt the economy. In terms of geography, France emerged from the Thirty Years' War as a major force within Europe. It was positioned between some of the major powers, like Spain to the south, the Holy Roman Empire, and now Austria to the east, and England across the Channel. But after the Thirty Years' War, the Habsburgs were weakened, and France sought to continue to grow as a power. And so Louis XIV specifically grew his military, amassing a standing army of 100,000 troops during peacetime and 400,000 troops during wartime. It was a grand strategy, but it was a costly one. In terms of religion, France experienced the wars of religion that had wreaked havoc across Europe. And of course, the French civil wars were definitely on the mind of Louis and other monarchs. King Henry IV, the first from the House of Bourbon, brought peace and stability by converting to Catholicism and by signing the Edict of Nantes, which allowed French Protestants the freedom of worship in all places except for Paris. However, Louis XIV was noted to say, one king, one law, and one faith. And he did mean it when he said, one faith. In 1685, King Louis revoked the Edict of Nantes, and numerous French Protestant churches were destroyed, and Protestant schools were closed. He even exiled pastors. With that, around 200,000 French citizens fled the country. Many arrived in the Netherlands, but some left Europe altogether and made their way to North America and the rising colonies there, some of them establishing themselves in French communities in Georgia. Now, if somebody has the longest reign in European history, they're probably going to have a list of achievements. And of course, Louis does have his list. He reformed and improved trade and commerce within France and brought it back from the verge of bankruptcy with the help of his finance minister, Jean-Baptiste Colbert. He encouraged new industries to be established within France or to be expanded, like the silk industry. And of course, the other new industries were glassmakers, ironworkers, and basically anything that could help spur on the economy. This also is going to help continue to grow the middle class. Secondly, Louis created a more efficient tax system that helped reduce corruption and increase tax revenue. He even had the person that Jean-Baptiste Colbert replaced thrown into jail for corruption. Now, these taxes will be needed due to the spending of Louis as he ushered in the various wars that he did, and he also created the Palace of Versailles, which was very costly. Now, Versailles is, of course, an achievement. It was once a hunting shack, a really, really nice hunting shack, of King Louis XIII. Now, little Louis XIV visited the site a few times as a child, once when he was three and again when he was 13. However, when he was a teenager, he truly did fall in love with the area and eventually then changed the shack into an immense and luxurious palace that Louis officially moved into in 1682. Now the construction did not end when Louis XIV moved in. It continued as more rooms were added on and the artwork and beauty of the royal residence was finished. One of the main rooms, the Hall of Mirrors, contained 357 mirrors, which at the time period um, was something that was kind of very rare. And so it became a popular place for dances and for games. It also would become the future location where the Treaty of Versailles will be signed after the end of World War I. 
In terms of politics, Louis was able to construct France into the quintessential example of what absolutism was. He personified the state, and if anyone in Europe used the phrase the king, they were usually referring to Louis. He was the sun king, who was also the state. When you thought of France, you thought of Louis as if they were one. Now, as a child, Louis experienced the Fronda, or rebellion, and it left a mark on him and his future reign, as he no longer really wanted to rely on other people. Why is this? Well, as a child and teenager, he had to rely on a regent, and his regent was Cardinal Mazarin. In 1648, the Parliament of Paris objected to Cardinal Ra Mazarin's financial policies as he looked for funds to pay for the costly Thirty Years' War. Now, Mazarin ordered to have Parliament arrested. And now, if you remember Charles I of England trying this, in, uh, trying this, you can remember it really doesn't go so well for him. And with France, the same thing happens. A revolt breaks out among the provincial nobility. And the king's life was endangered. But... In time, the revolt broke into factional fighting instead of a unified force against the king, like what we saw in England with the English Civil War, the Roundheads versus the Cavaliers, two solid groups. But here in France, it just broke up into faction versus faction versus faction versus faction. And so the movement died in 1653, yet it was traumatic for Louis and he immediately sought to reduce the power of the nobility when he became the sole ruling and reigning monarch of France. How did he do it? Well, with the construction of Versailles, he invited the nobility to come live with him at his royal residence and gave them the posh lifestyle of luxury with dances, games, great food, and, well, leisure. He would then have the nobility fight about who is going to be there for the morning dressing ceremony and who is going to put on the coat instead of them fighting about policies and power. As Louis put it, he domesticated the nobility. Louis took part in several costly wars, though, during his reign. The War of Devolution of 1667 and 1668 was fought over the Spanish Netherlands, or what is today known as Belgium. When the fighting broke out, an alliance formed with England, Sweden, and the Netherlands fighting against France. In the end, Louis only took 12 cities, but he grew angry with a former ally, the Netherlands. And now he looked at them for the next conflict. The Franco-Dutch Wars were fought from 1672 to 1678 and again turned into a war of alliances as other nations bound together to offset the large French military. Although England was initially siding with the Netherlands, Louis was able to pay off King Charles II of England and have him leave the conflict. Yet other nations would join in. The Netherlands had the support of Brandenburg, Prussia, Munster, Sweden, Spain, and other nations as the years went on. And this war, which is already forming into a big alliance, is going to be followed up by the Nine Years' War or the War of Augsburg, another costly, costly conflict that turns into a war of alliances. And during this war, Louis made a foolish attempt to invade England, but was blocked by the English and Dutch navies, thus not accomplishing any part of his goal. The big war, though, occurred in 1707 with the War of Sp Spanish Succession. This war gripped Europe into fighting until 1714 as people were fighting over who the next king of Spain would be. Now, Charles II was the king of Spain, and he was a Habsburg. He also suffered from a lot of issues because of, well, a lot of inbreeding that occurred prior to him being born. Now, he did not have an heir because he physically couldn't have a child. And when he died, he left the country not into the hands of a Habsburg, like from Austria, but instead in the hands of Philip of Anjou the Bourbon grandson of Louis XIV. Now, this caused a lot of concern 
within Europe that Spain and France could become one. And then how do you stop that power? And so fighting broke out among the major nations of Europe and ended eventually with the Treaty of Utrecht, which allowed for Philip to become the king as long he was taken out of the French king's list and Louis XIV obliged. However, getting rid of the Habsburgs in Spain doesn't necessarily help France for in the long run because a new rising power is coming up. Great Britain, as a result of this conflict, now was in control of Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, the Hudson Bay, Gibraltar, locations in West Africa, and more Caribbean islands. And so although France diminished the power of the Habsburgs by having them lose control in Spain, the British were now a powerful foe. In terms of economics, after all of these wars and after all of the cost with Versailles, Louis was in financial hardship. It was tough. And so he told his grandson, the future Louis XV, to maintain peace. And he actually had a quite elaborate painting drawn in Versailles about peace being the thing where guns and weapons and swords are broken apart to form violins. However, Louis XV is not going to 100% follow grandpa's orders as he himself will be involved in costly wars like the American Revolution. Furthermore, Louis XV is going to run into financial hardship with a stock market crash caused by a Scotsman, John Law, who really worsened the financial problems of France and who will also contribute to what eventually will become the French Revolution. Louis XIV created a glamorous world for the elites of France, like the nobility, the aristocracy, but for the general people of France, they were not seeing the luxury of the era. Instead, they served in the army or they plowed their fields, making a living any way they could. Although the middle class was growing in numbers, the vast majority of people, 80 to 90 percent, were still farming on the fields of France, living the peasant's life. So this was the biography on Louis XIV. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. And always remember to like and subscribe. Thank you. Bye-bye.